Good morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning. It's going to be a wonderful morning. Dan is going to speak to us, continuing our Love Your Neighbor series. I have the privilege of leading us in dedicating two beautiful little boys. Welcome to those who are watching online. One of the favorite psalms, probably the most often quoted psalm, of course, the shepherd's psalm. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. May you be refreshed as you worship with us this morning. He guides us along right paths for His namesake. Maybe He has something to say to you this morning about the path He wants you to take. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. We celebrated Helena Burlack's life yesterday in a magnificent memorial service. A wonderful life well lived and he was with her in challenging times to the end. You are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. May you find comfort this morning. He prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He anoints our head with oil. Our cup runs over. About time to stand up. I think this is getting better and better, isn't it? He anoints our head with oil. Let's stand together. <laughs> our cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will run after us all the days of our life. And we will then dwell with Him forever. And the church said, Amen. What a privilege it is to get together to praise the Lord. And we're going to do that in song right now. So lift your voices. If there is no shadow that has ever overcome your life, there is no rival that could ever stand against your mind. We've always been with us. Every
I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. All of my fear, I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance. I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. All of my fear, I will turn into praise. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance. I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment. Show me what the can do. Show me a mountain he can move. He is a God of the breakthrough when anything is possible. Do you believe it? Show me one thing that's too high. Show me what else he can't hide. He's a God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. It's possible. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. In you, all things are possible, Lord God. Thank you, God. Bless your name, O oh Lord. You're the God of the possible. You are also the God of impossible in that you overcome impossible. Thank you, Jesus. Let's worship our King. Put your hands together.
thank you, Lord, that you are alive. And because you are alive, you have made us alive. Thank you, Lord, that in every step we take, you look after us. You meet us where we are. And though sometimes we're not walking a straight path, we take a side road, we take a side step, we stumble. <laughs> you are there with us. You are there to care for us, to heal us, to renew us, to re-energize us. We just pray that we are obedient enough to receive you, Lord God. Lord, right now we want to pray for our, our boys and girls, for Mount Pleasant kids. Bless them, O oh Lord, and their, and their teachers and the volunteers over at MPK as they talk about you being the gate that they have to go through you, that they need to choose you with all of their heart. Lord God, may we as a church be instrumental in ensuring the person who's standing beside us chooses you, chooses you this morning, chooses you tomorrow, chooses you through the week. May, be, we, may we be that kind of family here at Mount East. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Boys and girls, it is time for you to walk to your programs. Bless you as you go. We pray that you will encounter God in a very real way today. And maybe share it with your parents. Because sometimes as grown-ups, we forget stuff. And it's not because we really forget. It's just we've grown more stubborn sometimes. Amen. <laughs> now we're going to do this beautiful new song. This new song, Christ is Risen. You may recognize some of the words. It is a beautiful combination of hymns past, which, talk, um, with, which is a God experience of composers from long time ago. And we've combined that with the expression and their experience of modern composers. Isn't that great that we can acknowledge the different expressions because all of our stories are different. Sing with us. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. For I once was lost, but now I'm found Was blind, but now I see Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave
heaven's sweet embrace. I'll see your scars, your open arms, the beauty of your face. The tears of joy. On, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took spices they had prepared after Jesus' crucifixion and went to the tomb, the borrowed tomb where Jesus was laid. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they arrived, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were there wondering about this, suddenly two men, in clothes that gleamed like lightning appeared and stood beside them. In their fright, they bowed with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, I love this, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Don't look for Jesus in dead religion or dead practice or striving hard to please him better. He's alive. Relax. You're a whole lot worse than you think you are. But the grace of God is greater than you ever dared imagine it could be. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Remember what he told you. Father, we come together this morning to remember what you told us, to rejoice in your resurrection, to thank you for beautiful little children and for each member of this church family so precious to you and to us. And we thank you for this worship that we have enjoyed and we offer it to you in Jesus' name. The church said, amen. amen, amen. Please be seated. Thank you very much for joining us this morning and those who are here for the beautiful little children who we will be uh, shortly to dedicate, a very special welcome to you. We're particularly delighted that you've joined us. We're an international church, one of, the, one of the hallmarks of us. We're international and we like to say intergenerational. And I'm wondering, and I don't want to embarrass them, and Trish, if I do, then please forgive me, but I'm going to ask you to do it anyway. Um, I wonder if, if Trish and Celia and Maxwell and Patricia, if, if they're all with us, would stand wherever you are. There we are. And uh, part of the, yeah, thank you. Part of the reason... <laughs> Part of the reason I wanted, to, wanted them to stand is, in, as an international church, we get such, we get it, we're enriched. The, the people from the subcontinent come in those beautiful saris and our, our Chinese people bring culinary delight and Chinese New Year, which is a wonderful institution. And look, let's look at this magnificent dress, which I think is wonderful. Sadly, uh, to, this morning is the last time that, um, that Celia and Maxwell and young Patricia will be with us. They're heading back to Ghana. But Trish, we're believing they'll be coming back, are we not? Amen. Okay, thank you. Please be seated. There's other family news. Uh, John Logan had a pacemaker uh, install, uh, put in there. What do you do? Do you install, Dr. Steve, do you install a pacemaker? Is that what you do? Or insert? <laughs> insert? Thank you very much. Medically correct, you insert a pacemaker. So John has, thank the Lord, been pacefully, uh, successfully inserted. And uh, Nick and Margie have a beautiful new grandson little Freddy, and uh, so we're, there's a lot to rejoice in, but yesterday, as I said, we celebrated Helena's 100 years, uh, and as one of the family members said, in her final years, she had, as the, old, as the old rugged cross said, she had to lay down a number of her trophies. More and more was taken from her, but she had the most stunning faith, and it was a wonderful celebration of life. Let's come to the Lord, and I'm sure you have things in a church family our size, things on your heart that you want to bring to Him. And he's here by the Holy Spirit. So let's talk to him. Just, well, put into words, silent words, what's on your heart. He already knows, the Lord knows what we, what, the Lord knows what we desire before we ask him. But he tells us to ask with thanksgiving. Lord, we do present to you the Richard and Linda and the family in 
even though it was a wonderful long life, it's still mum. And we still miss these beautiful people in our lives. And we thank you for John's successful procedure. We pray for those in our church family who have upcoming procedures, that you would be with them. For those in pain, that you would, they'd know your presence and your power. Holy Spirit, in a troubled world, we bring you our state and federal governments. We pray your wisdom for our leaders. We pray that your name would be honoured in our nation. A lot of hearts go out to those who have been utterly devastated by the, the massive earthquake and unbelievable damage in Turkey. Prompt your church, Lord, to be your hands and feet and heart and voice in that region and practical help. Father, we pray for Dan as he's about to come and speak to us from your word. Anoint him, Lord, as you always do and open our hearts, open our eyes that we may see that this is a living word and that you speak to us. And Father, as we come to make our offerings, we thank you that they are, we're simply returning to you what you have first given to us. Our next breath comes from you. But Lord, we want to bring you our best first as an expression of our love. In Jesus' name, amen. But just before you pass the buckets, for those who thought Mabry's getting old and he's forgotten, no, I haven't. I have welcomed you this morning, but I need you to know that we will have in the foyer a connect point. If you would like to know more about us, if you have a need you'd like us to become somehow involved in serving you with, or any of those things you can see on the screen, there's a huge connect point banner, even I could find it, and the people there are just wonderful and friendly. There's a coffee and tea and great fellowship and water uh, for any of those who don't do the caffeine thing. Uh, that will be available in the foyer and the cafe, the Sunday cafe, for those who need their coffee through a barista, that will be available as well. But now let's give together. There are offering buckets on the end of the rows. Many of us give um, online and in other ways. But for those who, who enjoy bringing their offering as part of their Sunday worship, if you just pass the buckets along the rows, they'll be collected at the other end. Thank you. All right, family, let's continue to worship the Lord in song. Let's sing about this good, good Father. Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard a tender whisper of love.
pray, Lord Jesus, that we would get a sense of the love that you have for us. We think about the beginning of our journey with you. It begins with a revelation of who you are, the great love that you have for us. The grace and mercy of the cross is such simple beginnings. And sometimes, Father, we, we get away from the simplicity of that simplicity of what it means to be loved by the God of the universe, what it means to be changed by that love, to walk with you, the simplicity and the beauty of knowing you. And so we pray this morning, Jesus, that as we get into your word, the song that we just sung would be more than just a song, that it would be more than words that we would know, know and experience afresh the deep love that you have for us. And it is a transforming love. And so we prayed this morning, Jesus, that you would transform us by the power of your love. Now this we pray for in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can take a seat. Wonderful. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to church. This is week two of our series, Love Thy Neighbour. Uh, Craig preached last week for the very first time and he was just absolutely fantastic, I think you'll agree. It was just really encouraging to see the Lord speak to so many of you. And it's something that we wanna do more and more. We wanna create space for God to do His thing in our services. So it was just really encouraging. Today we're gonna pick up where Craig left off as we focus on the why, it's in the title. We've allowed the Lord to to redefine our working definition of love and and now we wanna hit the motivation, uh, the driving force behind our love. We know that you can do the right thing for all the wrong reasons and we know that. Just look at the Pharisees, they smashed it. Or they followed the Lord down to the T, tithing from the herb garden, memorizing the Torah, you name it, they did it. And yet Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. Beautiful on the outside and yet inwardly dead. That's not a pass mark, by the way. 
It was absolutely possible for us to do the right thing for all the wrong reasons, for the heart to be in the wrong place. We probably all had encounters with the infamous cranky Christian. Hands up if you've encountered the infamous cranky Christian. Nobody. Well, that means you are the cranky Christian. If you've never met him, it's because it's you, okay? And everybody around you feels really awkward right now, but that's okay. And they know the Bible, right? Oh yeah, oh, they know the Bible inside and out, but it doesn't seem to translate. It's just miserable. The joy of the Lord is my strength, but whew, you wouldn't know it. Let's be real, you would not know it. And it's one of the challenges of the church that our lives, our community would be characterized by the message we preach. Hypocrisy reeks. And we all know that, and there's nothing more hypocritical, bringing it back to our message today, there's nothing more hypocritical than an ungracious, uncaring, and unloving church. Do you agree with that? Galatians chapter three, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. One people, no divisions, no pecking order, a caste system, no, we're one people. 1 Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you would be perfectly united in mind and thought. Imagine that. A group of people perfectly united in mind and thought. When it's true of us, it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's life-giving and countercultural. It's like a window into heaven, into the kingdom of God. Right? The sad reality is that so often it's not true. Just look at how many denominations are out there. Last time I checked, there were 30,000. Now there's 43,000. 200 years ago, there were 500. 400 years ago, there weren't any. Didn't exist. We survived like 1,500 years without the need for denominations. And it's just growing exponentially. So they think by 2025, they think there'll be 55,000 denominations. I don't understand how that's possible. I can't think of 55 things, let alone 55,000 things that are worth splitting over. And yet it's a reality. And that's just at a macro level. I think one of the emerging needs within the modern church is for genuine friendship. I can't tell you how many coffees I've had with people who are struggling, who've said, it's not the church. I, I love the church, I'm just lonely. I'm just looking for deeper connection. Lifelong friendship that I can follow Jesus with. People who are gonna hold me accountable. People that genuinely care. And you wouldn't think that that'd be something that's hard to find in a place like this, but sometimes it is. By the same token, you wouldn't think that politics and infighting would be a thing in the church, but sometimes it is. And we've all seen that. You talk to the guys over at Thornley, and they'll say that was their experience. Now, don't get me wrong, God is doing amazing stuff in that place. Last time I preached there, it was absolutely packed, 130 people, amazing. But they struggled with disunity for such a long time and it crippled them. And you think to yourself, how does that happen? We all know that we're supposed to love each other. We know that. You can't come to church for any length of time and not pick up on that, but left to our own devices, it isn't always reality. So what's missing? What's the church getting wrong in this space? What's, what's the driving force behind our love? That's our focus this morning. Why don't we read our passage in 1 John chapter four. We're gonna read from verse seven to verse 12. We've got your Bibles, I encourage you to open up and follow along, double check that we're not just making stuff up, but it is on the screen for you if you wanna read it there as well. 1 John chapter four, verse seven, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. That didn't sound good. We'll figure it out later. 
Whoever who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Highlight that, God is love. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son to the world that we might live through Him. Praise God. Well, this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And send his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. We pick it up with John saying, dear friends, let us love one another. That's the call, let's love one another for love comes from God. The Greek there is agapetos, let us agapao one another for agape comes from God. It's the same word, just in different forms. And Craig talked about it last week, but this is a specific form of love. It's not philia, the love that you have for a close friend. It's, it's not storhe, the love you have for your family. And it's not even eros, which is a romantic love. This is agape. It's the highest form of love there is. Agape is a selfless love. It's unconditional and sacrificial. It gives and expects nothing in return because it's not about the recipient, it's about the heart of the giver. And the Apostle John loves the church like that. And he calls us to love one another with that love. You know, when I have a serious conversation with Seb, generally because he's done something wild that drives me nuts, and I wanna have a serious conversation with him, I'll I'll get down to his level and I'll put a hand on his shoulder and I'll look him in the eyes because I want him to see my face. And I want him to feel the love and affection that I have for him so that no matter what I say, he knows that it comes from a place of love. That's when I'm being a good parent. Sometimes it doesn't go like that, but when I'm a good parent, that's how it goes. And I read this passage and and that's the picture I get. This is a shepherd, a, a spiritual father who's correcting his people because he loves them. And you've got to understand the credibility he had on the table because of that. They wouldn't have doubted his love. They knew it. Persecution experienced by Christians at that time was pretty horrific. The apostles were on the forefront of that. So you better believe that John suffered for the gospel, for them. And tradition says that Emperor Domitian tried to boil him alive because he refused to stop preaching the gospel. Now, He survived by some miracle, but then they they turned around and they exiled him to the island of Patmos, which is essentially a labour camp that tried to work people to death as a form of punishment. This is someone who endured things that you and I can't imagine. Someone who was willing to lay down his life for the gospel, for them. He's not calling them to something that he's not already embodying He's saying, follow me as I follow Jesus in the way of love. There's an authenticity and a a sense of authority in his words because of the life he lived. And they're incredibly challenging. John won't allow us to, to relegate love to some kind of secondary issue. He says in verse 20, Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or a sister is a liar. Or does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen, who's right in front of them, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And John's not afraid to confront us with the truth, but we've got to be so careful. You read that through a legalistic lens and you'll completely miss the point. John's not saying if you love the people around you, God will love you. That's not what he's saying. Don't turn this into a box, you've got a tick. It's not about earning anything. It's not what it is. It's about evidencing the genuine nature of our salvation. And what he's saying is you can come to church, and you can sing and, and, and lift your hands and give and do all kinds of things for God, 
But if you're not passionate about people, if you don't have a genuine love for the people around you, alarm bells should be going off everywhere because he is love. If he dwells in you, love will too. You can't have one without the other because this is who he is. That's why he can say, you love God and yet hate a brother, you are a liar. It's easy to fall into the trap of solo Christianity, particularly in this age. I can just watch it online. I don't even need any of you. Just me and Jesus walking through life and that's, that's all that matters. And here John challenges that idea. He says, the love you have for God and the love you have for those around you is inextricably linked because God is love. And how do we know that? Well, he says in verse nine, this is how God showed his love among us, revealed it among us, made it known. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. This is what real love, like agape love looks like. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Remember, agape is, is a selfless love. It's unconditional and sacrificial. It gives and expects nothing in return. The cross is all of that. It's the ultimate expression of God's heart. And when your circumstances are making it difficult for you to see the goodness of God, the cross stands as an everlasting reminder that He is for you. Everlasting reminder. That's why it's central to the church. It's, it's our anchor. It brings everything into perspective. And you might be here this morning really struggling. And I was sitting there asking God, why? Why didn't you intervene over here or answer that prayer over there? And we've all been there, I get it. But I look at the cross and I'm reminded it cannot be that he simply does not care. It's not what it is. I know that he loves me. I know that he's for me. I've seen it with my own eyes because I've seen the cross. And that is the heart of my God heart of our God. He gave up everything for me. That's agape love. That's, that's how powerful it is. And it should be a marker of our community. But here's the key. You won't find that kind of love in here. It's not something that I have to give. It's something that's been given to me. Remember what Craig said last week, agape love never fails. Like never? Because if that's true, I can't do that. And neither can you, but that's the whole point. It's the whole point. John is calling us to love one another with the same love that God has for us. But you can't give that kind of love if you aren't, haven't first received it from the Father. It's not about trying harder. It's not about beating yourself up until you just do better. It's about soaking in the love of the Father, being filled with the love of God that it might flow out of you into the people around you. In other words, it's not about effort. It's about intimacy. It's the key, it's about intimacy. You can't give what you don't have. So stop striving and start soaking, start being filled with the love of God that it might flow out of you into those around you. And we all know the truth, this is that only God can change your heart and only He can produce that kind of love in your life and in this place. If you make it about you and you try to do this in your own, you will never, ever produce that kind of love. It's the divine love of God. Good luck. It's not the answer. I've got to soak in it. I've got to receive it. I've got to be filled with it. It might flow out of me. It's the only way it's possible for the people of God. So it's the only way for us to actually walk in obedience to this passage.
Everybody remember the story of, of Corrie Ten Boom? Raise your hand if you remember Corrie Ten Boom. Like a hero of mine, just an amazing person. If you don't know who she is, Google her. Do a bit of research, right? You'll thank me for it. And the short version of her story is that essentially her, her and her sister were hiding Jews during World War II. Unfortunately, they were caught and discovered, and, and so they were thrown into a concentration camp, which is obviously horrific. She saw both her father and her sister die and, and endured things that you and I just don't have a framework for. Couldn't imagine. She survived. She had an incredible faith. She's just a beautiful Christian lady. So post-World War II, she actually went back to Germany on, on several occasions because she felt called to the German people. That's amazing. In her book, The Hiding Place, she says, it was 1947 and I'd come from Holland to defeat a Germany with the message that God forgives. Wow. That's powerful, really powerful. I want to read you an encounter from a book where she was confronted by one of the men who'd abused her. She said, it was a church service in Munich when I saw him, the former SS man who, who had stood guard at the shower door in the processing center at Ravensbrück. It was the first of her actual jails that I, jailers that I had seen since that time and suddenly it was all there, the room full of mocking men, the heaps of clothes, Betsy, who's her sister, pain-stricken face. He came up to me as the church was emptying, beaming and bowing. How grateful I am for your message, he said, to think that as you say, he has washed my sins away. His hand was thrust out to shake mine and I, who preached so often to the people in this region of the need to forgive, kept my hand at my side. Even as, an ang even as the angry, angry, vengeful thoughts boiled through me, I saw the sin in them. Jesus Christ had died for this man. Was I going to ask for more? Lord Jesus, I prayed, please forgive me and help me to forgive him. I tried to smile, I tried to raise my hand, but I just, I just couldn't. I felt nothing, not the slightest spark of warmth or charity. And so again, I breathed a silent prayer. Jesus, I cannot forgive him. Give me your forgiveness. As I took his hand, the most incredible thing happened from my shoulder, along my arm and through my hand, a current seemed to pass from me to him while into my heart sprang a love for this stranger that almost overwhelmed me. And so I discovered that it is not on our forgiveness any more than on our goodness that the world's healing hinges, but on his. And here, I want you to listen to this line. When he tells us to love our enemy, he gives us along with the command, the love itself. That's beautiful. I think church, if we could, if we could only get a hold of that, the power of that love, the power of a community marked by that love. Transformational power it could have in us, in our community and in our city. Now in and of myself, I'm not capable of that. Neither are you, but he is. John is so clear, we love because he first loved us. That's verse 19. It starts with him, not with me. It's not meant to be a burden, it's meant to be the natural overflow of the intimacy that we have with him. That's what we see in verse 11. John says, dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It's just natural, how could we not? No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and His love is made complete in us. That word complete is telau, and it means to perfect or, or, or to reach its goal. And I want you to think about that for a second. The love of God is perfected. It reaches its goal as it leads us into loving community. That's a beautiful thing. It's life as God intended. I love the way that John Piper puts it. He says, when he, that is John, says we ought to love one another, he means ought, 
the way a fish ought to swim in the water and birds ought to fly in the air. And living creatures ought to breathe and peaches ought to be sweet and lemons ought to be sour and hyenas ought to laugh. Born again people ought to love. It's who we are. This is not mere imitation. That'll be duty if you make it imitation. It's not mere imitation. For the children of God, imitation becomes realisation. We are realising who we are when we love. That's joy, not duty. And it's as natural as breathing because this is who we are. This is what God set us apart for, to love Him and to love people. And when we get it right, when we walk humbly before God and pursue intimacy, because it's not about effort, it's about intimacy, it's powerful. It's really powerful. That's when the people of God shine. Not because of what we do, because of who we are. Set apart by the love of God in us. That's why John says in chapter 13 of his gospel, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples. They'll see that you're set apart if you love one another. That's why we get to the end of this passage and he says, no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives or or abides in us. And I know it's a little confusing, but essentially John is saying, when we love each other with agape love, the same love that God has for us, we make the invisible God a tangible reality. It's like air. No one can see it. But as the breeze hits your face, it's tangible. It's an undeniable reality because it's right there. It's the power of a loving community, a community filled with the love of God. It makes the invisible God a tangible reality. I don't know about you, but I want to see people walk in here and experience the tangible reality of God. So I hear John's words and I'm challenged and I'm inspired. I think the truth is that we haven't always got this right. We've all heard stories, whether it's someone coming to church for the very first time and being scolded for wearing a hat. True story, by the way. Or the gay couple who's been turned away because they were holding hands. Or the homeless person who's been given an incredibly wide berth because it just makes us feel uncomfortable. And we haven't always got this right and we need to be honest about that, but we also need to know that in and of ourselves, we never will. There's only one way for the people of God to express the love of God and that's about intimacy. It's not about effort. I look at someone like Corey Ten Boom, I, I see the power of God's love and all I can think is, God, do that here in me, in this place. I wanna see our community changed one person at a time. I wanna see the lost find life in the name of Jesus. I want people to come in here and experience the tangible reality of God. And I'm grateful that he lets me be a part of that. There's no greater joy than seeing someone's eternal reality change from darkness to light. There's nothing better than that. And I get to be a part of that. I do. The love of God fills me and flows out of me into those around me. I get to be a part of that. And it's an amazing thing. You know, as I was preparing this morning, I felt like the Lord said to me, there's a difference between a friendly and welcoming and nice and then agape love. There's a difference. This is good, but anybody can do that. This is the stuff that God alone can do. And I think the Lord wants to take us deeper. I think he wants to take us from from a nice church a very warm, welcoming place, a nice church to a community marked by agape love. 
It's a deeper thing. Something countercultural in that. There's something supernatural, something of God in that. See, here's how I want to finish this morning. We're gonna create some space for God to speak to us this morning. We wanna allow him to deepen these truths in our hearts. Craig kicked this off last week and there's something that we wanna do more and more. We wanna wanna learn to hear the voice of the shepherd and we wanna give him the space to speak. I'm gonna invite the band to come back up. Truth is, I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't. You could be in a beautiful spot with the Lord, praise God if you are. Or you could be here and barely hanging on. You could go on through a dry season where God just feels so far away. Or you could be here and if you were honest, you would say, I've never experienced the agape love of God. I've heard about it. Maybe this is your first time in church, but maybe it isn't. Or maybe you've been coming to church your whole life so you know all about it and you know all about what it means to follow Jesus but you've never experienced the love and the goodness of God for yourself. So would you bow your heads with me? This is just between you and the Lord so I encourage you just, just to bow your heads, close your eyes. I want you to invite God to speak. In a sense, God is always speaking, but we're not always listening. And our hearts aren't always open. So let's soften our hearts and invite God to speak to us this morning. Remember the words of Isaiah, here I am, Lord, your servant is listening. Call to love. We know that's about intimacy, not effort. About intimacy. One of the biggest killers of intimacy is unconfessed sin. So let's invite God to lead us into the light. David says in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let's pray that prayer together. Jesus, lead us in the way everlasting. Search me. Reveal in me. Sometimes the Lord speaks through a picture or a word. Sometimes it's a scripture that brings to mind or sometimes it's just a thought that pops into your head that just won't go away. But He speaks and He reveals and He always does it from a place of love. Thank you, Jesus for your grace and for your mercy, which you knew every day. That we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. When you look at us, you no longer see our sin, our depravity, you see the perfection of Jesus. And the cross is our hope. It's an everlasting testament to the agape love of God. It's not meant to be ethereal. God wants us to know and experience that love. He's not distant. He's right here with us. The invitation this morning is just to press in. I invite you to turn your loving affection towards the Father, maybe for the very first time. And Lord, our simple prayer is show us who you are. Show us 
you love. Fill this place. Fill each and every person here this morning. Fill us that it might flow out of us into those around us. That people might see and experience the tangible reality of who you are. This we pray for in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Stand with us, family. Let's sing our final song. If love endured that ancient cross, how precious is my Savior's blood. The beauty of heaven wrapped in my shame. The image of love upon death's frame. If we have in my heart was worth a pain, what joy could you see?
Jesus in this place. We recognise if not for the cross, the love, the grace, the mercy, we wouldn't be here. We thank you, Jesus, that it's not about us doing better, trying harder. We thank you, Jesus, that it's all about you. It's all about what you do in us. There is no limits to the love that you have. You can do things that we just, in and of ourselves, we just cannot do. And so we pray, Jesus, that we would be a community marked by that love. We ask for that, it's our great desire. The joy in that, the life in that, the power of people seeing the tangible reality of God it's our great prayer, Jesus, do that here. It's a start in me, start in us. And this is we pray for in the precious name of Jesus. Amen, amen. Next week, we're gonna be continuing on in our series. Graham's gonna be speaking us on, to us on the topic, who do we love? Who do I love? We're looking at the, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Also next week, M. Nichols is getting commissioned. Look, is a ministry leader over pastoral care. So that's gonna be very exciting as well. We get to commission her and pray over her. There's soul care tonight for those of you who are coming back at 4.30. As always, we encourage you, if the Lord has spoken to you this morning, one of the best things that you can do is to respond by getting somebody to pray for you. And it doesn't have to be a ministry leader. It doesn't have to be someone down the front. Although we'd love to pray for you. It could just be the person next to you. You could just ask the person next to you, would you pray for me? This is what I feel like the Lord said to me this morning. I wanna be obedient to that. I wanna respond to that. So would you pray for me? That's a powerful thing. I'd love to see the people of God gathered together, praying over one another. So as always, prayer is available. We just pray that you'd have a wonderful, wonderful week and we'd love to see you back here next Sunday. So be blessed and have a great week.